worship together. Every day with you, Lord, is sweeter than the day before. Every day with you, Lord, is sweeter than the day before. Every day with you, Lord, is sweeter than the day before. Every morning I will worship, every evening I'll adore. Cause every day with you is sweeter, sweeter than the day before. Oh yeah, let's sing that again. Every day with you, Lord, every day is sweeter than the day before. Every day with you, Lord, is sweeter than the day before. Every morning I will worship. Every evening I'll adore Cause every day with you is sweeter Sweeter than the day before What a privilege to know you What a privilege to know you Like I know you To be loved like you love me What an honor to worship Truly worship From this heart that you have me the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. Every day with you, Lord, every day sweeter than the day before. Every day with you, Lord, every day sweeter than the day before. Every morning I will worship, every evening I'll adore. Cause every day with you is sweeter, sweeter than the day before. What a privilege to live life, really live life, overcoming anything. What a reason to lift up, really lift up, every day my everything. From the rising of the sun. Setting of the sick Every day with you, Lord, every day Sweeter than the day before Every day with you, Lord oh, oh, Sweeter than the day before Every morning I will worship Every evening I'll adore Cause every day with you is sweeter Sweeter than the day before new today, this is a call and response. I'll sing a line and you sing it back. Like this. Every day, every day with you, Lord. Every day, every day with you, Lord. Every day, sweeter than the day before. Every day, sweeter than the day before. Every day, every day with you, Lord.
today to lift you and your name high. Thank you from whatever you've brought us from this week that we can focus our time and attention on our Creator and our Redeemer, on our Restorer. God, we give you all praise and all glory. We believe that in this moment you are here and we are here and we have gathered in your name for your honor. So we thank you for meeting us here. And we ask God that you would guide this service through the infilling of your Holy Spirit, all that is sung, all that is said, and certainly God, our attention to your word as it comes in just a little bit. We thank you and we praise you in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. Tower of strength, my 
So while we were doing communion today, what a joy it was to have six friends in our church today from Fresno, California. These are people that are friends. These are people that we've done this with over the years. And I just thank God that, that his church, whether it's here at Inspire or next door at Palm West or another church in Sun City West or a church around the world, there are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who celebrate their relationship, our relationship together as a church. I thank God for that. It is time for our offering. It's a part of what we do as worship at Inspired Church. And I say it every week. You probably get tired of it, but tough. <laughs> this is a time to say what? Thank you to God for the good things that he's done in our lives. All right, here's a couple of probably familiar songs that are influencing the song that I'm going to teach you this morning, right now, as we're worshiping through giving. <clears throat> to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. You know that song? Yes, to God be the glory. It's a great old hymn of our faith. How about this? God will make a way. Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my God Hold me closely to His side With love and strength for each new day He will make a way He will make a way so those two songs, when I heard this next song a few years ago, I thought of, and you'll for, figure that out as we learn the words together. 
This is unto God be all the praise. So I want you to sing the chorus with me like this. Unto God be all of the praise. Unto God be all of the praise. For he has done great things. So forever we will sing. Come on, sing it again. Unto God.
of you that are regulars at Inspire Church, you know that this looks a little different today. <laughs> Normally we have some neat stuff on the front and a place on the, for the sermon on the back. Well, what happened was I decided not to even prepare a sermon today and just do something impromptu. So what I want you to do is I want you to think of your favorite Bible passage. All right. I'm going to have you call that out and then I'll preach on it. All right. So <laughs> Think right now of your favorite Bible passage, all right? Think about it. And on the count of three, I want you to shout it out to me, all right? You ready? One, two, three. Exodus 14. Very good. That's what we'll do today. (laughs) Magically, I've got slides for Exodus 14 already prepared. It's amazing, isn't it? Hey, how many of you have ever jumped off of a high dive? Let's see your hands. All right, the high dive. Do you remember the first time you tried it and how difficult it was? Man, okay, yeah, somebody had to push you off that board. Maybe for you, you felt something like this. That's the way I felt the first time I went off the high dive. I was in fourth or fifth grade, and uh, we were out at the community pool. All of our friends were swimming, having a great time in in Ohio on a beautiful summer day. And I just got it in my head, I'm going to go off the high dive for the first time in my life. No big deal. I got out of the water, walked over to that ladder, and I started up the ladder, which surprised me at how long it seemed. (laughs) So I made it up to the top of the ladder, no big deal, and I made a bad mistake. Instead of just running and jumping, what did I do? I walked out to the edge, to the end of the board, and then I made my second big mistake, which was what? I looked down. I discovered in that moment that that high dive was 793 feet high. It was amazing. And how much higher it looked from up there than it did from down in the water. So now I have a dilemma. I don't want to jump off. But what can I do? I know. I'll go back. And I turned around and I could see that the ladder is jammed full of my friends. And my one friend, who's the idiot, is the one at the top. And he's calling me all kinds of names. Chicken, coward, everything you can imagine challenging me to jump off the high dive. To make it worse, I'm in fourth or fifth grade. We are just beginning to notice girls at that point in our life. We won't talk to them or anything because they have cooties, but I, I notice that all the girls are down there looking up at me on the board. What am I going to do? So I walk back out at the edge of the diving board, stare down at the water, and I'm scared to death to take the first step. But with my friends behind me, my friends in the water, everybody yelling at me to jump, I decide to take the step. And it was amazing. The moment I took the step, gravity took over. (laughs) It was so easy at that point that once I took the step, The rest of it was pretty simple. I hit the water, and I jumped for the first time off the high dive. I've done it many times, at least twice since then. (laughs) But here's the point. 
The challenge was to take what? The first step. The challenge was to move forward. When everything in my head said, I want to go back. Today we're starting a a, a series, a four-week series of messages uh, based on the Israelites and their adventures in the Old Testament. Uh, Today, uh, and the, the whole thing is about following God. We're calling it Quo Vadis, Quo Vadis, which is the Latin word for where, it's a Latin phrase, for where are you? Quo Vadis, where are you? Where are you going? Where are you going? And uh, the idea is we're going to look at what it means to follow God and to ask ourselves, where are we going in life as we follow God? And also, I'm hoping over the next couple of weeks, we'll also talk about where are we going as a church. Inspire Church is now uh, over nine months old, and uh, people are always asking us, where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going as a church? So we're going to look at the adventures of God's children, the Israelites. Today we're going to talk about moving forward. I'm excited that next Saturday, Pastor Brian is going to be preaching on the need to be obedient as you follow God. And then in the third week, we're going to talk about facing giants as you follow God. And then in the final week, we're going to talk, I think you'll find the the final message interesting. Um, What to do when you're successful following God. So I think uh, you're going to, I'm hoping, be uh, moved by these messages and be challenged by these messages to sort of answer the question for yourself, where are you going in life as you follow God? And today we want to talk about um, uh, it all begins with moving forward. That If you want to follow God, you need to move forward. And I want to begin with Exodus chapter 14. So if you'd open your Bibles, I'd appreciate it. Uh, if you use your phone app, turn on, your, uh, turn on that app on your phone to Exodus chapter 14. Very familiar story for many people, whether you've heard it in church or watched it on TV. If you've seen the movie The Ten Commandments, it's the story of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Most of you know the story. They've spent uh, centuries, literally, in Egypt under slavery, slavery under Pharaoh. And they've cried out to God, and God has heard their cries. And God has sent Moses to tell Pharaoh what? Let my people go. And through a series of plagues, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh finally relents and tells the Israelites, get out of here. I've had it with you. Leave. So millions of Israelites leave. Uh, They they are set free from their slavery. And this huge throng of people are moving forward. And they come to the Red Sea. And when they come to the Red Sea in Exodus 14, Pharaoh realizes he has lost his cheap labor workforce. He's realized, oh my gosh, I let the slaves go. Who's going to mow our grass? Who's going to work on our roofs? Who's going to do the stuff nobody else wants to do? Pharaoh changes his mind and he sends his entire army in chariots to pursue the Israelites. The Israelites panic. They freak out. They turn on Moses. They turn on God. And they say to Moses, they say to God, why did you bring us out here to die? We want to go back to Egypt. We would rather be slaves under Pharaoh than to face death out here by the Red Sea. Let's pick up the passage. Let's go uh, verse 13, chapter 14. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Did you catch that? Tell the Israelites 
to move on. Raise your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I'll harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. I'll gain the glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went to the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind, turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Tell the Israelites to move on. If you want to follow God, you have to do what? Move on. You have to move forward. As I look at this passage, I want to suggest that there are three choices that not only the Israelites faced, but we face today as individuals. We face it as a church. That if we're going to follow God, we have three choices of direction. There's three ways that we can move. Let's take a look at those. The first choice that we have is to retreat, to go back. I'm amazed at how many people in churches, and I go to a lot of churches, and I hear this quite often. I wish we could go back to what? The old days. I just wish church could be the way it used to be. You guys have never said it. You said that pretty well. You never said that, I hope. Don't let me catch you saying that. I like to quote that famous theologian, Billy Joel. The good old days weren't always good. And tomorrow's not as bad as it seems. I check the scriptures on this. And there are times when people had to retreat, to go back. But I could never find a single example where that was a good thing. That when God's children retreated... It was always because they had been defeated, and the defeat was because they had been disobedient. If you want to follow God, going back is not an option. I've said this a lot to you, and I mean it. One of the things I love when I preach is I find things I never saw before. And it's like, Jim, you say that every week. Every week I see something new. I saw something this week I never had seen before. It said in the passage, maybe you heard it, as Pharaoh's armies are coming and and God is trying to calm the people down, it says that the angel of the Lord moved from the front of the people to the back. And that the, the cloud, the big pillar of smoke and fire, went from the front to the back. Now, I'd read that many times, and I assumed what I think it does mean is that God placed himself between Pharaoh's army and the children of Israel. That's the obvious reading of the passage. But what I saw this time for the first time, the children of Israel wanted to go which way? Back. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Notice what God does. He places his angel and his pillar behind them. Never had seen that. God blocked the way back. Why would God do that? Because he wants his people to go where? Forward. Forward. 
you can choose to retreat. Your second choice is to stay. Is to stay. Moses said to them, be still. Just stop. You've heard the phrase, don't just stand there, what? Do something. No. Don't just do something. Stand there. In verses 1 through 4, we didn't read them. You can read them on your own. In verses 1 through 4, the people are instructed to set up camp. To fool the Egyptians to come and attack them. So God actually instructs his people in that moment, I want you to stay right where you are. Here's the point. There are times when we follow God that God wants us to stay. To stand and be still. Let me suggest to you three reasons there are times when we need to stay. Those times when we need to pray. I know we always pray. We should always pray. But come on, let's be honest. There are times when our journey is critical. And in those critical moments, we need to stop and hear the voice of God. Whether it's in your own life or as a church, there are times when we need to stay, to be still, and to listen. When you stay, when you be still, in order to pray, the second reason you need to stay and be still, I believe, is to strategize is to strategize, is to make a plan. Read verses 1 and 4. God was laying out a plan for the people to survive the attack of Moses. So I think there are times in our lives and times in the life of the church where we need to strategize. We need to stop and make plans. My wife and I, Um, You know, we we are just at that point in life when we're beginning to look at retirement. And we've got a friend who's a financial wizard. And he has agreed to help us make plans for our future. So we're trying to find time in our life to stop, to stay, to be still, and make some plans to strategize. So when you stop and when you're still, you need to pray. It's a time to make plans, but it's also a time to mobilize, a time to get ready to move forward, okay? So you have your choice. You can retreat, but I'm just letting you know that's a really lousy choice, and I'm not sure God's real excited about that. There are times when God wants us to stay, to be still and to listen, But if you're going to follow him, the third choice is to move forward. To move forward, to get off the dime. If you're going to follow God, you need to move forward in life. If a church is going to follow God, if a church is going to become the church that God wants it to be, it needs to move forward. Jesus talked about it very clearly about new wineskins. You don't put new wine in old wineskins. You don't take an old patch of cloth and, and, and sew it onto a new garment. God is into new things. Jesus said, behold, I'm making all things new. Uh, Paul said, if any man or woman is in Christ, he or she is what? A new creation. When God moves, he calls us to move forward. And I just want to let you know that's not often comfortable. Because when you move forward, it means you have to do what? Anybody? Thank you. Change. Change. Moving forward involves change. But here's the deal. God works when we move forward. God was teaching, the, was teaching Moses and the Israelites 
that's somewhere between here and there. If you will just move forward somewhere between here and there, I'm going to intervene and do something really big. All the Israelites could see was Moses' army and the Red Sea. And God said what? Move towards the Red Sea. Uh, But God, there's a lot of water there. I can't swim. Move forward. But God, move forward. But God, move forward. Somewhere between here and there, you'll discover that God will do something big. So God tells us, keep walking. Keep running. Keep trusting. Keep moving. And I will honor your faith. I want to share with you three other examples from Scripture that illustrate this principle, I think, in a very powerful way. The first is Joshua chapter 3. These same Israelites, but a generation later, they've already walked through the wilderness for 40 years. Moses has died. Joshua's the new leader. And now, finally, God's promise is ready to come true. The people are ready to enter the promised land. God's told them it's going to happen tomorrow. But again, there's a problem. You see, the promised land's right over there. I can see it out those doors. But there's a big river right here called the Jordan River, and it's in the flood stage. And there's no bridges. There's no ferries. There's no way across the water. But God says, I want you to move forward. So God says, tomorrow, Joshua, I want you to get the people ready. I want you to put the priest in the front with the Ark of the Covenant. And I want the whole nation to start marching towards the water. Now, can you imagine being in the front row? You're one of the priests. All right, let's go. The trumpets blow. We're going to start marching. No problem. And you're marching and you're marching and you're seeing the river and it's getting closer and closer and you're slowing down and taking smaller steps and the people behind you are pushing you and you're like, hey, quit shoving. And you come up to the water. This is so cool. In Joshua 3, it says, talking about the priest. And their feet touched the water's edge. Wow. Their feet touched the water's edge. You know what that means? There's nowhere else to go. And guess what happens? God dries the water of the Jordan River. And the people march across on dry land. John chapter 2. It's Jesus' first miracle. It's called the miracle of the wedding in Cana. Jesus is at the uh, wedding party. Would have gone on for a couple of days. These people were not Baptists. (laughs) Because they were drinking heavily. And they ran out of wine, which was a social embarrassment. Mary's there. That's uh, Jesus' mother, (laughs) like a typical mother. Everybody's freaking out. There's no wine. It's an embarrassment to the host. And Mary says, don't worry. My son's got this. And she says to Jesus, the son of God, hey, fix him some wine. (laughs) Only moms can say that. It doesn't matter if you are Jesus. Jesus. And in Luke chapter 2, Jesus says, all right, and he tells the servants to fill six huge jars full of water. And then he tells them, he says, take a ladle of this water and take it to the master, the person that's throwing the party. And in Luke chapter 2, Jesus says, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And so they're walking with this ladle of water. They are moving where? Forward. And somewhere between here 
And there, the Perrier turned to Chardonnay. (laughs) But only as they walked forward. Luke 17, there's 10 lepers. Leper was leprosy, horrible disease in that day. And it totally isolated you from your community. You lived in literally a leper colony. And one day Jesus came across 10 lepers. And they're crying out for healing. They're crying out for Jesus to address their miserable life. And Jesus tells them in verse 14 of Luke 17, go, show yourselves to the priest. These guys have leprosy. They have not been healed. And Jesus tells them to go to the priest. You see, the priests in that day were not just religious leaders. They were also sort of the the health control officers of the community. And only the priests could declare you clean of leprosy. So these ten lepers begin walking towards town, which was illegal. They weren't allowed to do that because they had leprosy. And I'm sure they're walking and some of them are like, oh, why are we doing this? We're not allowed to do this. Look at us. We're covered with this stuff. But the passage says, as they walked forward, as they were going, they were cleansed. They weren't cleansed here and went to the priest. They had leprosy and they moved forward. And Jesus healed them. Somewhere between here and there, God works in our lives. Now what I see in Exodus 14, what I see in Joshua 3, what I see in John 2, what I see in Luke 17 is this principle. Your step forward is a step of faith. Your step forward is a step of faith. As God leads us, every time we are willing to take a step forward, what it is is a step of faith. And people get this. God rewards steps of faith. Romans says that the righteous shall live by what? Faith. And it's not that we manipulate God. Our faith doesn't make God do anything. Our faith taps in to the incredible, mighty power of God. So as a church, where are we going? That is the funniest question. Brian and I ask that question to each other all the time. And when we're really honest, you know what we'll tell you? We don't know. But we know this, we're going forward, period. We're going forward. There's a room full of people today that keep showing up every week, I think, because you want to go forward. Isn't this fun? I mean, it's really cool to be in a newborn church that's going forward. We're walking by faith. We're taking steps of faith and watching God do things that we can't even begin to imagine. In your own life today, Quo Vadis, where are you going? Are you going anywhere? The one thing I've learned through ministry, it doesn't matter what age you are. God is never done with you. All right? God is never done with you. We ought to do a sermon series someday of of the people that God used at the ends of their life. Because it is exciting. 
So I need to ask you today, where are you going? Where is God leading you? And maybe you've sensed God leading you and you've just been standing still. God, let me pray. Good, pray. God, let me make plans. Great, make plans. God, let me mobilize. Mobilize. But sooner or later, God's going to say what? Go. Move forward. One of the things that we want to do in Inspire Church, we want to help people meet Jesus if they've never met him before. And I'm really thankful that almost every Saturday this room is filled with people who already know Jesus, okay? So sometimes I'm like, all right, God, Everybody knows Jesus. I don't want to stand up there and give an invitation. And, you know. But God says to me, Jim, that might not be who the church is today. But maybe a year from now, there's going to be people who don't know Jesus. So maybe this is practice of inviting people to give their hearts to Christ. So I want to ask you to indulge me. In one more week, allow me to give an invitation today. Giving your heart to Jesus Christ is like taking a step forward. Imagine, if you will, a line in your life And on the other side of that line is the word belief. And you sense in your heart that God wants you to take the step across the line to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of God and the Savior of humanity. But that line is intimidating. You're not really sure what it'll mean if you take the step. When you take that step of belief, that step of commitment, it begins the most amazing journey you could ever imagine as you begin to follow Jesus Christ. And my invitation to you today is this. If you have never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I want to invite you today to take a step of commitment. To take the step that says to God, today, I become a believer. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, God, only you know the hearts of people. God, I just very simply pray that if someone here today is feeling and urging in their heart to make that step of belief, I just pray that right now they would join me in this prayer. Our Heavenly Father, God, this afternoon, I want to take the step of belief. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to receive him as my Savior and Lord. I confess my sin, but I reach out for my Savior. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Today, if you've made that decision to step across the line of faith, to move forward, I really would ask you, don't leave today without talking to me. I'll be hanging out here. Just come up afterwards and say, Jim, I made a decision today to give my life to Jesus. I would love to pray with you. Brian. His will has
has always been my aim And each step along the way I've had to say That I'll do my best To listen to his call And say I surrender all So now today I'll follow the Lord No matter the plans that fail Or when things are going well I'll still follow the Lord And I'll trust in His Word Cause it will never let me down See love, hope, and grace abound When we follow the Lord unsure almost at every turn and yet every time you've learned that his strength prevails so will you press on and listen to his call will you surrender all and clearly say Lord, no matter the plans that fail, or when things are going well, I'll still follow the Lord, and I'll trust in His Word, cause it will never let you down, see love, hope, and grace abound, when we follow the Lord. So follow the Lord, and no matter the plans that fail, or when things are going well, still follow the Lord, and trust in His Word, cause it will never let you down, see love, hope, and grace abound, when we follow the Lord. Love, hope, and grace abound when we follow the Lord.